so episode 44 and um we are uh, and, and it always is we always like to thank our guests for giving us their time for uh, uh and anecdotes for free but never more so than when they've got up at, at stupid o'clock as as annette has because she's in melbourne so she's on the t- same uh, time zone as craig so five uh, five a.m there is it now so yeah, yeah. alarm set alarm set in the hour of four so we just can't thank you enough we really really appreciate it and uh, really looking forward to getting our teeth stuck into a topic um that, that i personally uh, um, am uh, not 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 hugely uh, experienced with so I'm looking forward to it myself and that is the topic of footwear and falls um, which uh, Annette has you know we're going to touch on some of her publications in this area shortly but she's she's incredibly uh, equipped to to deal with any questions that anyone watching has got in this topic we'll we'll just get the ball rolling with the questions that came in beforehand if that's okay Annette and then we'll, sure. we'll roll through and just just see where see where the chat goes uh, organically uh, first off, uh, the current guide, I believe, I'm, I'm, I'm led to believe there are guidelines, current guidelines on, on footwear and falls uh, for, for the elderly, for the healthy older people. Could you tell us a bit more about them, please? Sure. Um, that's probably the best place to start, I think. Um, yeah, there's the American Geriatric Society and British Geriatric Society clinical practice guidelines for uh, prevention of falls in older people. So it's a combined Um, falls guideline which is uh, great Um, so that's uh, the way the guidelines are formed they look at all the evidence and um, and look at the most uh, preferably areas that have the uh, high ranking evidence so they look at all the randomized control trials um, other experimental trials in lieu of any where there's uh, precarious or limited data they have um, expert panels that then make a consensus on the on the recommendation. So the panel membership generally consists of um, falls experts in falls research, uh, clinical practitioners med- from medicine, nursing, allied health and, and other. Um, they also get um, expert um, other experts in um, as well. And uh, they also listen to practitioners in the field who have implemented the guidelines. So whenever there's a review, um, they look at the previous guidelines and then they use the, the, all the available evidence to inform the next lot of guidelines. So that's the evidence is then broken down into its ranked. So from A, B, C, D, highest level A, um, then B, uh, C is where there's, uh, so I'm just going to read off my paper here because it's a bit easier, where there's no recommendation for or against routine provision of an intervention. And then it goes down uh, D and E. So currently, for footwear and falls, um, there isn't uh, good robust evidence. So it's a ranked of evidence C. So it's um, a recommendation from consensus by the group. And that is around its uh, footwear and falls management of so management and footwear assessment. So that's the recommendation in the guidelines. It talks a little bit about some of the evidence that exists in the multifactorial falls prevention um, research that's been done. But basically, um, yeah, it's it's not great evidence that they're basing the falls lo- um, guidelines on around footwear and falls. It says footwear assessment and recommendation, but it doesn't actually articulate what that is. So that's a, a little bit, it's a bit scant for my liking that that's the guideline, but that is the guideline. Um, the American and British guideline. In Australia, we have the Australian um, Safety uh, Quality and Safety Commission here that our hospital guidelines are based on for healthy older people um, and falls prevention. And that also looks again at the evidence, similar sort of panel membership to create those recommendations. Um, and yeah, again, the level of evidence to support footwear um a recommendation there is scanned as well and there's a, the um our recommend the recommendation within that guideline has a picture of your typical low-heeled lace-up oxford style shoe as the recommended safe optimal shoe and then then a high heel as the the shoe that older people shouldn't be wearing there is a caveat next to the figure that says there are no uh, experiment the evidence is low as there's no experimental studies on footwear that examine falls as an outcome so again it is there's no data, no good evidence to say that uh, low-heeled lace-up shoes are what we should be recommending for falls. Um, it, it's on consensus and a simulation of the of evidence that's been put together to create the guidelines. So 
we can't say definitively, yes, low heeled lace up shoes are the ones that older people should be wearing in regard to safe, safe, safety management in falls. And we can't say they're not. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically where the guidelines sit. Perfect. Thank you. And how, how regularly are they up? You, you mentioned a couple of times there are panels getting together and updating. Is it, is it an annual thing? Is it, is it no, biannual? No, it's not. It's the, the most recent ones I have are, are 2011 and that's an update. So they, they, it'd be lovely if they were done more recently. And the, uh, Australian guidelines are from, I think it was 2004 or 2009. So, to, so they're, they're not done as regularly as they, you know, it's, it's, it's not a regular update. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Perfect. And I guess the, sort of leading on from that, if I can just make one more comment. So, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, they, so as uh, I'm talking about falls here, so in regard to footwear for people with foot pathology and conditions, you know, that's uh, the low heeled lace up shoes might be, you know, something of podiatrist we recommend, certainly what I would was taught in my undergraduate degree is what we recommend but in for footwear and falls um yeah we that the recommendation is through culture tradition you know habit what we've always recommended and yeah there's a bit of literature and, and things that i found in my studies that look at especially around high heels and at high heel habit and habituation over time where you know some older ladies who have worn high heels over time actually coming down from a high heel to a, a lower shoe um, yeah, can be problematic for them. So, yeah, it's it's the more I looked into it, the more it was confusing. And um, yeah, it was it wasn't an easy easy out. I was hoping we could find something that was definitive. Yes, these are the shoes that are going to be safe for you, but they, that just wasn't the case. Great. Um, as we've touched a bit on the research, it seems like a, a sensible place to to take our next question. Um, with respect to the research, what, what, what do we, we talked about what we, what we don't know, what do we currently know about footwear and, and about falls? Okay. Um, well, the, a lot of the research has been laboratory based. So uh, looking at particular um, styles of footwear, so things like slippers in, in relation to like our traditional or optimal, we'll call them the optimal shoe, because that's what the literature says. Although there's many ways to describe our low heeled lace up shoe that we recommend uh, podiatrists and um, health professionals recommend sturdy shoes, safe shoes, optimal shoes, whatever you want to call them. There's um, a lot of research that look at them in relation to slippers or high heels, or they look at particular uh, footwear features. So the outsole or the tread or the particular height of the heel. Um, what else? Uh, uh, shoe collar height, heel counters, those sorts of things. But those are, are primarily laboratory based. So how replicable they are in real life is, is really unknown because the, the studies that we have to, to call on around footwear and falls for real life examples are mostly around uh, that retrospective questionnaire. So it's relying on that, that recall of, of what the person was wearing at the time of fall. So the laboratory-based studies are, are fantastic. There's, you know, uh, the, they look at stability, they look at gait parameters, um, toe clearance, which we know can be a precursor to a fall or a trip, a trip or a fall. Uh, but in a laboratory situation, uh, they, the outcomes are generally around that balance and stability rather than falls outcome. So we can't then, we can make an assumption or a it can say could lead to falls but again we can't make that definitive call to say having a heel counter or not or having dorsal fixation on a shoe or not will um, cause the, a person to fall we can say it can reduce their stability it can change the gait parameters um, but we can't make that extra step to say that this is a problem with falls we can say it could be an, a consideration for falls but we can't make that leap cool um just to piggyback onto clearly what you mentioned there of the, the work being in the lab and not necessarily therefore extrapolating out into the real world is, is, is like a limitation of this kind of research. And yeah. One of the questions that came in was actually what, what pitfalls are there in, in falls and footwear research? I guess that's, that's a pretty big one. Are there any others that we need to be aware of so that we can read this research moving forward in, in that context? Yeah, sure. Uh, one, one of the big issues I had was around naming conventions. Um, uh, a high heel, uh, depending on which paper you read, can be described anything from three centimetres to 10 centimetres. Uh, there's no sort of, there's no real standard about how we 
a measure. So it's hard to replicate research when you have differing opinions on what is considered to be a high heel or a mid heel or a low heel. And then you have the heel configuration. Is it a spike? Is it a wedge heel? Is it a Cuban shape? Um, the difficulties there. Also, uh, a slipper. In Asian, uh, and, um, Asian countries, a slipper is considered an outdoor shoe. So it's a, a lot more like a sandal as described in the research as I was reading through, rather than a traditional slipper light that we have in our Western culture, which is something that, you know, I know I've got them on at the moment because it's five o'clock in the morning here. They're nice, soft, comfortable things. They're an indoor shoe. So, you know, that relatable, you know, how we have, we have naming conventions for, for footwear, uh, walking shoes or sturdy shoes, you know, there, there isn't a naming convention where we can replicate things easily in research so that we can say, yes, this, this is relatable to our real life situation. So I found that was very problematic. And in a systematic review that I did, we actually created some operational definitions for that reason, just so that we could categorise things in like for like, because it was hard to pull that data together in, into some an, into an homogenous way so we can actually, could actually um, review it. So that was a difficulty as well. Um, yeah, just the... Um, yeah, and then the real the real life research was very much on recall. So older people and recall, you know, depending on when you're asked about when you had the fall, what you were doing at the time of fall, what footwear you were wearing. We, you know, we know older people spend a lot of time in their homes. We know that they wear slippers when they're at home. We know that they fall down when they're at home. Are the three of them linked or is it just because they're at home a lot, they wear slippers a lot? You know, therefore, you know, there's an assumption that if they fall, they'll be in their slippers. We don't know exposure times. We don't know how long, you know, are they the shoes that they're wearing at the time of the fall? We don't know definitively. Often it's retrospective or someone else is telling us, a carer or, or someone like that. I think technology, uh, the way it's going, we have an opportunity to do better research with better methodology to have real-time data, um, GPS in shoes, you know, things that we can, you know, the, we can, we can do so that we have more accurate data so that we know it was this particular type of shoe that has caused this fall. So I think, I think in future there's a lot of opportunity. Just at the moment there's a lot of deficit in our knowledge base and, yeah, a lots of, but there's lots of opportunity to do more in this space. Sure. Actually, Annette, just, just backing up a moment, the, the comment you made before about the, a lot of the research and evidence coming from the laboratory, I can recall a keynote address at a conference probably 10 maybe even as long as 15 years ago by Peter Kavanagh it was at a biomechanics conference so the, the audience was biomechanists and yeah this was a very long time ago and he got stuck into them um, sort of talking about that you know all this work being done in the lab it's not going out to the field and with, with obviously the proper clinical field trials and he gave many examples of where the laboratory work had shown some really good positive results, but then when it went out into the field, it didn't work. And the, the classic mm -hmm. example for me is lateral wedging for medial neo A. We've got laboratory studies showing it's it's awesome. It, it reduces that adductor moment um, by quite a substantial amount in the laboratory. But when you look at the clinical trials on it, it's you know it's not really working that well at all. Um, so I just wonder if you want to comment on that. With the, you, you a lot of the guidelines are based on laboratory studies that haven't actually been re replicated in the field. Yeah, no, look, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And you know, one of my studies was it was a lab based on the, the one of the first ones I did, which has got me very excited about research because mm -hmm. we looked at minimum toe clearance. We had we were able to isolate, you know, the the degrees and the gate parameters were, you know, it was quite clear about what was happening in the, in, in a controlled environment. But, you know, the reality is that's, that's not how, how we function. And there's so many other variables that, that are, that interplay in, in real life. And yeah, so it's um, when you, when you start putting those things into real life situations, uh, especially footwear, you know, we, we, surfaces change, activities that older people or anyone perform, you know, that we take those into consideration. There's also risk behaviours that, that occur as well. Um, and if, if footwear over time, you know, we know so outsoles wear, we know, um, you know, and that, that will change the, the functionality of the footwear. So there's there's so many other variables that need to be considered or, or situational type things outside of a controlled environment. And yes, um, you know, it, it's great when we have that 
that knowledge that to then take it out. But I think that's the important step that we're missing here is that we need to replicate what we've done in the lab outside so we know. And I think it's a nice place to start, but I think until we can actually put it into practice in, in real life situations and how we do that, um, yeah, I, I, I just, I think we need to take these things with a bit of a grain of salt because, yeah. yeah it's, it's, you know, it's I, mean, I, I, agree, I agree totally. You've got, to, you've got to start in the lab and, I think with Peter's presentation was was a critique of his colleagues, and he, he was just saying, you know, why are we keep why do we keep stopping at the lab door? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I'm, no, must it would have been at least fifteen years ago, and I actually reminded him about a year ago about that keynote address, and I I, and I just said, oh, look, do you remember that keynote address you gave fifteen years ago? And he didn't actually answer me. All he did was roll his eyes. <laughs> uh, the implication being with you know that his colleagues were still stopping at the laboratory door <laughs> um, but it's a safe place it's you know it is it's a you know and and yeah. we can get some good results in there uh, you yeah. know it's it's we, we need but we need to move on you know the brave step is to take the next step and i i just i think we can get there but it's it's a it's a hard one to do yeah. Um, yeah, but, but also I guess one of the other things is that people are very stuck in convention and, and about what they know and what, what they <coughs> feel and, um, uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we're very wedded to our low heeled lace up shoe in podiatry. That's, you know, this is our, our holy grail and, and, you know, of course it's going to be great to, for, for foot conditions and to, as protection, but in falls management, you know, I've, I've, in the areas that I've worked in, in, in falls in subacute and rehab, you know, the worst, the, the last thing you want to do is tell someone the wrong thing. And, you know, that's why I went to the evidence to have a look, you know, do, are, are these shoes the right thing for people to be wearing? And for, like I said before, coming down in heel height, especially for women, is, is that the right thing? Which are going to change proprioception with the, the kinematics of their gait. Uh, you know, you, physician do no harm as you know, how we don't, we don't want to do that. But we're we're very much wedded to this convention. So to put to put it out there that maybe we need to do things a little bit differently was, um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I certainly got a few digs from my colleagues. I work with a biomechanist. I work with physios as well. And on and on. We can't question. It's the low heeled lace up shoe is 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 our is our go to shoe. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd like to read you a comment that I got um, from uh, when I put my systematic review up. Um, for publication you know sent it out obviously yeah. in research we're used to rejection but um yeah a comment that came back around um you know when i questioned and said the, you know the evidence suggests that there's no tangible evidence or no real good evidence to suggest that low heeled lace-up shoes are what we should be recommending for um falls and no, no nothing against but there's you know we can't say that and it was out outrightly rejected in this paper and the comment <laughs> was that inappropriate shoes can contribute to falls and even if the evidence showed otherwise, it would not alter the clinical practice of those examining footwears, those examining footwear for people at risk of falls. So it was quite a, <laughs> a damning comment. Um, I don't think it had anything to do with what I'd put up. I think it was, it was quite typical of the response I was getting that no, low heeled lace up shoes are what we're going to continue to recommend. It's, no, yeah, that's fine. It doesn't matter what your research shows. We're still going to carry on doing what we do. You know. That's right. <laughs> Which you know uh, it was a bit of a, a kick, but at the same time, it was, it's made me think. Well, actually, I, I disagree. I think we should be doing more in this space. We we need to know, and we need to be offering the right advice. And you know, it, yes, research is about questioning these conventions. So. I make no apologies for that. And I think we, we do be doing more in this real space. Yeah. Just, um, just before we move on to the next question, and Kylie's just made a valid comment about we, we stop at the lab door because the real stuff, um, the real life stuff is so expensive to replicate. And I mean, that, that's quite valid. You know, the yeah. laboratory research is, is not as expensive to run as a out in the field clinical trial to, to see if it actually applicable. So that sort of fits in with the comments I made and that Peter Kavanagh was making in his keynote. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I also saw Kylie meant, said, uh, "Is the reason that we stop we, we we stop in the lab and don't take it out that lab shoes are so ugly?" Um, <laughs> you know, it. So, and, and actually, that that's a lovely little segue into sort of a, a sort of a cluster of questions we've got. We'll, we'll move away from the research and come into the more 
day-to-day pragmatic stuff because we know sure. that that editor notwithstanding most of us would change our practice in the face of evidence but they'd yeah. still be there for whatever that told us when we then relay that to the to the the, to the person, the human sitting in front of us. It's, it's on them whether they take that on or not. So can we move into the world of, of how people choose shoes? And I know you published a paper in JAPMA, um, which was mainly focusing on elderly women and, and, and the decisions they make. So coming away from the research and looking at the, the people that are sitting o- over the other side of our desks, what what goes through their mind and, and, and what decision, what filter or, or process are they sort of adopting to... to choose their shoes in the first place because that seems like a a barrier to us regardless of the research yeah oh absolutely and i think clinically this was one of the things and i've been a podiatrist for 25 years and in clinical practice and we're very very authoritarian authoritative you know you know when we tell people you know you need to be wearing these sorts of shoes you need to get out of those ones they're causing you these problems this is the type of shoe you should be wearing without any consideration about what the person's values or considerations are from the other side. And I know I did that for a very long time. The reality is, and just, just going back to how that the um, that paper came about, the, the, the ladies that I used in the previous study, in a lab study looking at toe clearance, like they were given low-heeled laced up our optimal shoes. So 30 of them were given those shoes and slippers to for toe clearance in that study. And then the following study, the Good for Older Ladies, I questioned them about, you know, uh, primarily looking at their safety, you know, if safety was ever a consideration with their choice, but a raft of other questions, you know, do you choose, how do you choose your shoes? Is it based on looks, cost, you know, are your brand loyal? Where does that come from? Only half of them after the study were we're still wearing the low heel lace up shoes and the word ugly appeared a couple of times. Um, well, no more than a couple of times. Uh, and even within the previous, in the, in the lab study, uh, they were given the shoes quite early on to wear and to get used to uh, wearing them over time so that they had some you know, familiarity with them. One of them had worn them a few times, then sent them to the op shop before the clinical trial that we were going to do. And when I said, no, you've got to come back and wear them in our trial, she had to go and rebuy them from the op shop to wear them in the trial. She just didn't like them and didn't want to wear them. So... Um, yeah, the the aesthetic, the, the aesthetics, and uh, what came back is the big one for low. They're just ugly. Can't wear them with a dress, um, or, or they consider shoes like that to be. And this is where the title came from: good for older ladies. You know, there was a seventy-five-year-old participant in that group who said, "Oh no, maybe if I was a hundred, I'd wear them." <laughs> yes, five. And so I think it was a bit of a wake-up call because I think the research team can, you know, we considered these ladies to be elderly but they did not see them as elderly and I think we we look we we can be quite ageist in our recommendation when you know just because you reach a certain age doesn't mean there's a certain way you should certain type of shoes you should be wearing or a certain way you should behave you know we we need to be more collaborative with how we we make our footwear recommendations and you know if aesthetics is a consideration and we're recommending these types of shoes, then we have a problem because, you know, we, we all know, you know, clinically we've recommended things in the past, especially footwear, you know, that will often sit in the wardrobe or not be worn or be worn to the podiatry appointment and then not see the light of day until the next podiatry appointment. So, you know, how do we keep these things on people's feet? But also how do we realistically make that work for them? You know, where people come home at night, if they're spending the, you know, the older people the majority of the time in their house during the day, you know, when we come home of an evening or when we're in the house, we're not wearing our, you know, sensible, optimal shoes that are going to restrict our falls. We're in our slippers or in something comfortable in the house. So we need to think about their, uh, be, yeah, be more pragmatic in our recommendation and think about what they're going to wear, uh, what their activities are, where they spend the majority of their time. And the, and the other uh, considerations. If looks are a consideration, and and even you know, I've, the discussion that that I often have, and I know some of the clinicians out there listening, you know, you you look at the the person as a whole, their activity, and as a sport pod, and I'm sure you know, you look at shoes that uh, fit with the type of activity that, that they're doing. The same should be, you know, we should be having a similar conversation with these ladies, regardless of their age. The activity that they're doing, how is this going to fit? Uh, because they see shoes as, as part of their fashion, not as a false 
intervention. You know, if they've got foot pain, they're probably, you know, they've figured that out already. They, you know, they'll be looking at shoes that have a bit more comfort in them. Um, but, but generally they're not, they're not considering footwear as an intervention in falls or, or footwear or foot management. It's, it's, you know, it doesn't match the outfit that I have on. Um, yeah, the, most of the ladies that, that I saw, I think there was a 24 pairs was an average about how many pairs of shoes they own. I don't know about you two, but um, <laughs> I own more than 24 pairs of shoes. I'm sure you two own less than 24 pairs of shoes. I'll just stab, take a stab in the dark there. Men are quite functional. <laughs> Women are very fashionable. Yeah. So, you know, and we have to, there are shoes that people buy for particular outfits. And, and all right, you, you may not agree with that, or, but if that's what the person, you know, that's, that's what they do, then we need to collabor collaboratively work with them if we're looking at footwear choice. I did see there was some sexist remarks in some of the literature that I read. And one of the comments um, or the conclusions was, um, around high heel wearing shoes, high heels pose an unnecessary risk at the end. Okay, well, unnecessary. It probably is unnecessary, but you know what? I, I, I just looked at that, mm, there, there could be other ways that we phrase that. It, it's again, it's making a judgment. You know, if, if, if we're truly working in a patient-centered model these days and what the patient, you know, what, what they want, we need to meet them, we may need to meet them halfway. So if they need to come down in heel height, perhaps, you know, instead of going from nice heel or kitten heel to flat, how we work with them to go down to a, perhaps a wedge or a, a Cuban style heel rather than a, no, you need to be in these ugly shoes. They're not going to wear them. They're, it doesn't work with children. It's not going to work with older adults. You know, don't tell them what to do. Work with them to see what they can, what is acceptable for them. Now, I also think there's, you know, in footwear design, we also need to be looking at, you know, incorporating our consumers and older people in that design as well. We have falls prevention footwear already that exists what's the uptake and compliance you know it's 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 variable uh, you know there a lot of them look like hiking boots or they look like ugly shoes you know we need to have something that's better we need to do better than that. yeah craig a couple of people made comment to your shoe collection oh, my shoe collection i noticed that <laughs> they're talking about the picture behind you <laughs> Um, a really, a really good comment came through here, and um, I'll just quickly mention it while it's on my screen. Uh, and it came into my mind as well when you were talking about the the difference between sexes. Um, do men care as much um, about what they wear from the truly aesthetic perspective? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, my research mainly focused on women, but it did include men in in some of the later stuff that I've done. Um, and it's a, I think it's a societal change. It's very reflective of, of where we're going. Uh, previously, no. Men, older men, and it's probably my father's generation, the, the, the 60, 70 plus now, they owned, you know, three pairs of shoes, their, their work shoes, their um, songs, and, you know, uh, uh, perhaps a pair of runners, something like that. These days, though, men are are much more fashion conscious so they tend to own a lot more more shoes so I, I think the the bar is shifting um and you know shoes are more accessible they're a lot cheaper than they used to be if we go back to you know the 40s 50s 60s it was much more expensive it wasn't it just wasn't you know what, what men men were very functional in their choices but now it's it's certainly shifting the other way so i think we we may not see it yet but i think we'll see that um, yeah, as um, as time moves on, I'm seeing a lot more of the uh, snake skin brogy type arrangements and uh, a lot of narrow toed shoes that are way too long for the feet that I'm seeing. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, to each their own. If that's your choice, we'll work with you. Um, yeah, and and certainly men, uh, even in the heel department, you know, a few more high heel or um, that disguised heel shoe to give you a bit more height. You know, again, no judgment if that's if that's how you want to roll. Um, yeah, we and I think we still need to work with people. And like I said, consider their preferences in in our recommendations. Sure. Actually, just just on that, Annette, um, Kylie just raised a good point. What, what's the rate of falls in older men versus older women? Is the uh, same different? Oh, they did. Uh, Kylie, it's this. That's not a five thirty in the morning question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she promised not to be intelligent at this time of the day. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one. No, look, no, it's much higher in falls. But look, women live a bit longer as well. So we have more data for women, um, uh, you know, at the other end, at the scale. So, 
Um, and women generally tend to, you know, injurious falls tend to be greater in w women as well because there's more of that um, osteoporotic type issues that happen in that age group. So it is, it is greater in women, much more so. Um, I, look, figures I can, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, but definitely women are, are outdoing the men at this stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm guessing in your experience, if people have foot pain, yeah. Um, the, the, and, and we are breaching a, you know, or opening up a discussion about, you know, considering different styles and types of footwear. It's a bit of an easier sell, if sell is the right word. Um, if someone's not in pain and they haven't got really any concept of the, the potential falls risk side of things, like it, clearly that, that discussion to me seems like it might go a bit, be a bit more challenging. I mean, why? Why would they or why should they change in their mind, at least, if, if they're not in pain? And how do you sort of um, approach those kind of discussions? That I know people listening will probably be having daily as well. Yeah, that, that's a really tough one because if, if there's, and there's certainly research that supports if you don't feel like you're at risk of, you know, of falls or, or any other issue, then you are not going to change your behaviour. It's going to be a very hard sell. And yeah, it's, it's a tough one because do we do the preventative element and, and have that conversation early about these are things that could happen um, and, then, you know, they're moving into that age group where these sorts of, you know, falls are becoming an issue. Uh, they should be considering perhaps um, different styles of footwear than, they, that, 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 than the ones they may be wearing or, you know, is it is it more, um, you know, once things happen and then that's the definitive time when things might need to change. That, that's a very difficult conversation to have um, those changes in footwear. And that's another thing that the, my research showed is that it's often that loss of identity and that uh, loss of choice when you have to go into those sorts of footwear. So it's a sort of thing that we, we tend to leave until we absolutely have to do it. I, I still think, yes, there's very much a place in, you know, where we can offer some preventative medicine. Absolutely. We want to keep people out of hospital. We want to stop them falling down. Falls are a huge burden to the healthcare system and only going to get worse as we live longer and the population ages. But I think, again, it needs to be more palatable about how we sell it. Rather than saying, you know, you need to come down and heel hide or you need, you need to be doing this, working more collaboratively in those conversations and, and part of a bigger full strategy. So around, you know, introducing it, there's, there's some great literature around multifactorial falls prevention um, that, that's been going on. So looking at more holistically and, and interweaving footwear into that. So, you know, exercise programs and... Um, uh, proprioception uh, and all those other things that we do is, and, and having that as part of an integrated falls management strategy. So, uh, yeah, and, and perhaps integrating it into exercise in, in gyms and other things where have you considered also these other elements around your falls management? If you've had one fall, then, you know, the education that's available. But, um, yeah, unless people perceive themselves to be at risk, it's very, very, very difficult to get them to change. Not impossible, but um, yeah, but I think it, we just need to sell it better and need to weave it into more of the um, something that's palatable and, you know, at least plants the seeds so that they can start thinking about that change. It may not happen straight away, but it, it um, yeah, it certainly plants the seed. Do we have um, good, good data on the strong elderly? I always visualise the pictures you see of the the 90 year old lady deadlifting in the gym. I always love seeing those pictures and the, the 75 year old man doing one arm pull ups. So I think they're amazing. And you hope that when you get to that point, that's what you're still doing. Do we have good data that stronger people are, are, are make sense to me intuitively are not going to fall? As yeah, much? I, I look, we, we do, we, we do. And we also have data that says that you can retrain if you've had a fall and you, and and certainly our falls clinics, um, you know, people who have gone through there, if, if they follow, you know, exercise programs and those and, and do the proprioceptive exercises, you, you can absolutely Im improve and reduce your falls risk. So, and exercise is key to that. Obviously, good muscle strength, uh, good uh, flexibility, all, all of those things and, and building that retraining in those proprioception as well, uh, all has very positive outcomes. So if we, and it, and um, in people who are healthy, but also people who, who have um, diabetes and all those, and, um, you know, all those other issues. If you, 
exercise, you cannot underestimate the value of doing that in falls management. Stronger, healthier, but it also has the, the, the added effect of building that um, more positive attitude and, and, and mental cognition as well. They, they, they see good results when they start doing these exercises and these, um, getting these gains. Um, so it starts to, to build mental and physical um, better aptitude so they understand that if I keep doing this, you know, my, my falls risk is going to reduce. Um, yeah, so I think if, yeah, if, if we continue to promote that exercise um, and those, um, those things that help reduce those falls risk, I think we'll, not only for healthy adults, but for people who've had falls, I think we're going to have much, much better outcomes in healthier people. Great. Um, there was a couple of questions that just came in that I've just disappeared off Craig. They were from Toby and both about the, I think we did, did we just, cut, have you still got them? Did we just cover them? I think Annette probably covered them. They were, where have they gone? Don't want to go past them if they're relevant. Have you got them on your screen, Craig? Hang on, I'm just getting some feedback. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for them. I'll look for them. Yeah, minutes. sorry, I just got um, some feedback then I couldn't hear anything here. Um, I just said there was some, a couple of comments while Annette was answering that question that okay. came up from Toby and Kylie that I glanced at and they've gone off my screen. I think they were relevant, but I can't remember them. Can you pull them up and just check yeah, before, Toby, we, before we move on? Just check them. Uh, Toby's been cracking lots of jokes, but he decided to be serious for a moment here. Um, <laughs> oh, do, it makes do, me uncomfortable when Toby's serious. <laughs> so do shoes and reality actually play a very small role in the multifactorial aspect of falls? Um, yeah. Um, what about strength activity, socioeconomic status, yeah. those other factors? I think look, it's a combination of, of all those. I absolutely agree. It is such a, uh, it's a, it's a minefield, uh, really. You know, even even the you know, the guidelines around wearing wearing your glasses, you know, it's a bit precarious. There's, there's not not a whole lot of evidence that that, that even makes a difference. So, um, yeah, uh, we I think that's the best way to, to look at, and I think the the most the best way to get buy in from um, our older population is. To, to look at those multifactorial things. And the evidence would suggest that they, they are the best way to go and, and they tend to work. So, um, yeah, the strengthening, stretching, um, targeted proprioception, um, they're all those environmental things, you know, also looking at, at home environment as well, the lighting that's in homes. I, you know, my nana recently who passed, she always had the blinds down to keep the, you know, to keep the, the warmth in and, and, you know, which made the house very dark, you know, house full of rugs and the valance around her bed that she perpetually tripped over. Yeah, there's all, all of those things that the home environment plus the, the, all the intrinsic things that we can do plus the extrinsic things. So, yeah, it is a combination, you know, polypharmacy is an issue. Um, you know, psychoactive medication, all those, all of those things that, you know, that it, there's, it's a bigger picture and that's why it's such a difficult space to play in because it's, I don't necessarily think it's one thing, it's, it's many things, but where is a, is a component, how big a component? You know, it, it's hard to say because we really can't, you know, it's hard to target it as a falls intervention, um, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking more closely and, and doing more research in that space. But I, but I guess you, if you just focus on the polypharmacy and nothing else, you yeah. it's the same same issue. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, um, it yeah. makes it make it makes sense that it's multifactorial. But I guess as podiatrists, the footwear is is often going to be our in, isn't it? It's often going to yeah. be the, the thing we're chatting about first, and then we can open up into those other are, other areas. Um, yeah. Can we talk a bit about sort of, um, I, I, and forgive me because I'm not sure if this comes under the remit of a, of, of a, of a podiatrist in this, this setting, but the sort of clinical assessment of, of falls risk. Um, in, in my cursory research for this episode, I do do a little bit just to make myself look a bit smarter than I am. I came across two things. One was a, um, a recently published paper which talked about a test they referred to as the three metres backwards walk where they asked people to walk backwards for three meters, funnily enough, and the speed at which they did it would, would be suggestive of their falls risk. I think if they did it uh, quicker than three seconds, they, had it, they were at very low risk, and if it took them longer than 4.5, they were considered high risk. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got, because uh, it's 2018, we've, we've got an app, um, which I, I admit to having no familiarity with whatsoever. I've not 
even downloaded it to me. So, um, but it's called Gates Themed. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with it either, but obviously there's probably lots of other things out there. And I just wondered if you could give your opinions on, on the three meter backward walk, if you know much about it, the app, if you know much about it, or any other clinical gems that people in clinic tomorrow can, can sort of say, oh, okay, I've got a few things now that I can use to assess risk if that's appropriate. Yeah. Um, well, I think nothing's, nothing beats starting with the conversation about it, especially if, you know, we often see a patient who's come in with a bit of a black eye or a, um, you know, the, a new walking stick because I've just had a fall or I've had another fall. So that's, that's always a good conversation starter. Um, yeah, I think as far as having a bit of an armoury toolkit in the, in the clinic, there, there's having, you know, I have worked in our, in our falls clinic. It's, um, there are good testing that can be very, some very simple things, things that we're already doing, like, you know, sensory testing, the, the monofilament sensory testing. So, um, you know, for, neuropathy is, is one that we already do or may may or may not do depending on your patient but that that's a that's a good one to do Our proprioception exercises are uh you know you're standing uh, um eyes open eyes closed obviously you don't want them falling down in your clinic so doing that in, in, a, in a safe way but certainly standing you know feet balanced apart and then eyes open eyes closed um yeah those are simple things um uh, your muscle strength testing um, is is another uh, you know, a good way to to ascertain whether or not you know they they have good strength for locomotion or if they're, they're, there's weakness there. You know recommendations for strength exercises using Theraband, even getting people out going for walks. You know anything that gets them mobile and active and keeps them active is is good. Or you know but uh, you know the there's value in 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 strengthening exercises as well. So, but it, it's a combination of things. I mean, the walk test, the one that you just had up on the screen, great idea, but it, I think you can't just have one test. It, it needs to be in combination with a few things. So if you look at, at muscle strength, flexibility, um, uh, yeah, sensory um, testing as well, um, and in combination, and if you're seeing a deficit in all of those things, then they're, they're going to have some falls risk. There's some, you know, there, there's good research um, around a lot of those very simple tests that 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 um, relate to falls risk and uh, you know it, it's a, it, as a podiatrist as a you know a clinical thing you can do tomorrow for your population because a lot of us have populated of patients who are in that 6 65 plus age bracket whether they've had a fall or not it's you know these are good things to be recommending um, around that strength and 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 um, proprioception if we can keep those things up so they have that sens sensory motor ability and 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 improvement if they if they do these small things over time then that will certainly reduce their falls risk um, again it, you know talking about it and say you know like we do with when we recommend exercises putting it into their life in a doable way. So if it's a TheraBand exercise at their chair side, maybe they're not particularly mobile, you know, asking them, you know, all right, you need, it'd be great if you could do these exercises to help with your falls management. You know, is there a time of day that's going to be suitable for you? If they're sitting down watching the news at six o'clock at night, you know, they've had their dinner, um, you know, it might be good to put it, put it chair side with their coffee, and uh, you know, do their exercises then. So fitting it into their life, so they actually do it, because you know, it's it's it, it's it's difficult to uh, prescribe these things and then off you go, and, and unless it's integrated in their life in a way that they get, oh, okay, yeah, I can I can do that, you know. And then when they do come back, celebrating those small gains, asking and and um, you know, seeing how they're going. Uh, but I think there's, a, you know, we can document these things um, and and keep an eye on it. And as podiatrists, that's something, you know, footwear is our thing. But, you know, as far as, as you know, helping with falls management, you know, the strength, stretching, proprioception stuff is all, all within our realm of remit. So, yeah, all things we can be doing. Sure. Brilliant. It, 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 sorry, Craig, one sorry. quick follow-up question. Is it reasonable then for people who are seeing anyone over 65 even if they're coming to see them for whatever it may be a bit of callus or a nail cut you know something basic um or routine i should say um is it is it reasonable if someone's over 65 to say we're just going to do a few almost like a screening uh, yeah. is that is that something that would be completely appropriate yeah i, I think so and uh, yeah I, you know we don't have to wait for people to fall down to do this and, you know, that's why I'm sort of a bit on the fence with full screening that we do in hospital. I think, you know, if, if 
you know, you're over this age, you know, of this age, then you, you are at risk. So, you know, and, and they're, they're simple little tests that we can do quite easily. Um, that and the footwear conversation, I think we have a lot of, you know, that's that's our thing, our, our, our value add. It's, it's difficult because we're not, it's, it's in a prevention world, it's hard to measure things that don't happen, you know, the things that we, we stop happening. But uh, I, I don't think that should stop us at all from, you know, doing, you, you're probably doing, you know, your, your sensory testing anyway, your muscles. These are all tests you're probably doing anyway. But if you put them in the context of falls, then, you know, there are nice little, little suite of things that you can do that, you know, that. If it, if it stops one person falling down, then, you know, it, it's a success. We may not know that, but if it keeps them on their feet and active and mobile and, you know, living that quality of life, staying out of hospital, then, you know, you, you're doing a, a, a wonderful service for, for the community. So, yes, it is reasonable to do that. Perfect. Sure. Now, and Kim's raised an interesting question, and I'm going to have a go at answering it before I pass it on to you, because I don't know what the answer, the evidence says. But she's raised the question about okay. what about barefoot. Is there a are you at greater risk or lesser risk if you're barefoot compared to wearing shoes? Now, my attempt to answer something like that would be um, there's perhaps more sensory input coming through with barefoot. Therefore, theoretically, there should be a less risk at falling barefoot. No, I have no idea if that's the case or not, but I just wonder. Yeah. yeah, well, that that again, that makes good sense. You'd think that, but yeah, again, well, you know, as we get older, that that, that sense may be impaired somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, look, there's research that that shows no difference between slippers and, and bare feet. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, with toe clearance, it tends to be lower in bare feet. Okay. Um, so, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you will trip and fall, but you know, if you're closer to the ground. Um, yeah, so that, that's a tough one, um, and you know, there's other reasons why why um, people don't go bare feet. You know, it, it, depending on where you are in the world, if it's cold, gen, gen, people like to put something on their feet. Uh, you know, whether that be slippers or socks or stockings or you know something like that. Um, yeah, that's yeah. It would make sense to think that, but the the literature tends to say that um, yeah, bare feet don't perform so well. That that some shoes are better, but again, it's either laboratory based or it's retrospective um, questionnaires that are telling us this stuff. So I think we need to be doing more in that space as well. So I can't again, I can't give you a definitive answer. And it wasn't bare feet was uh, I looked we did that in the in in the in the lab study, but it wasn't wasn't a focus. But it's absolutely an area that we need to be doing more in the future. Mm. Uh, Annette, your your paper in Gait and Posture a couple of years ago, uh, where you looked at slippers, I think it was, um, and this is where the when when I saw that barefoot question come in, my first thought was that people are more likely to do it indoors than outdoors. So then you've got that, although we don't, I don't think we have the data. You've got that thing of whether we should advise people are barefoot or wear slippers at home. Because from what I, what I took from your paper when I read it was was that slippers tend to be a bit more of a risk than uh, than I think what was referred to as a well-fitted foot. I think it was because of heel slippage, correct me if I've misinterpreted. Yep. So, I That's mean, right. your current sort of take, diabetics notwithstanding, would it be to advise barefoot around the house over slippers? Oh, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. They're, yeah, and not just with my research, that, but others, that, that slippers and, and bare feet tend, generally tend to be a bit on par. So... Yeah, it's you'd think bare feet would be safe, but uh, look, it's it's it. There's again, I'd love to say there's some definitive answers on that, but bare feet and slippers perform quite similarly in it with our gait parameters that we tested in that study. So um, some things were a little bit different, but I couldn't say that you know we couldn't say low heeled lace up that they definitely perform better. And I think because they had dorsal fixation and with the slippers, there was heel slip. Obviously we can't measure heel slip with bare feet. Um, but yeah, as far as gait parameter performance, they were quite similar to slippers. So, which was a bit of a, a surprise. So yeah, uh, in a healthy older adult and you know, I've, if often people will be bare feet in their home if they're not in slippers. Um, yeah, I think there's probably more that needs to be done in that space as well. But uh, yeah, it's when when some, when you're wearing a shoe, there's more sensory input to to move the shoe and to to lift the foot. And and we didn't do kinematic um, um, data in that paper, but there was yeah the the 
I think that if we did more in that space, that would probably give us a better idea. But look, I can't, I cannot tell you that bare feet are better because we just don't know. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, Kylie's also asked a question. I feel like I'm backtracking a tiny bit, but it's a good question. It's about how we communicate. Um, and we've done several episodes with people where we've talked about the language we use and, and good words and bad words, no C big words, words that terrify people, rightly or wrongly. And um, when, we're, when we're talking about falls with the elderly, in the, in, maybe in the context of, of, of someone that's never had one, and we're going to sort of tell them that we're screening them and why, how do we approach that discussion without? terrifying them we don't want to make them fearful we don't want to make them kinesophobic and, and ter terrified of leaving the house i mean is there a certain way we can go about that yeah uh, look i think i think that that positive um reinforcement that you know if, um it, to keep people you know what, what do they value about you know their, their life their their lifestyle that they have you know do they, they, most people, you know, people want to stay in their home as, for as long as possible. They want to be fit. They want to be active. They don't want to be, um, you know, struck down by any sort of illness. So I think it's in the raft of selling it as a health, you know, keeping you healthy. Uh, you know, these are recommendations that, that we would make. So whether it's around keeping your foot house, you know, as a podiatrist, making sure that you, you know, you're, uh, we look after them podiatrically. And, and as part of our armory saying, you know, we there's tools that we can use to test for, for falls risk and and this will help us, you know, give me an idea of, of how I can help you to, to not, you know, to reduce your risk of falls. So, that, you know, these tests that we can do, we can have a look at those um, parameters and then I can make some recommendations about some strength exercises or other things that you can add to your, your daily exercise or you might want to consider taking up because these will help you stay healthy for as long as possible. So I think framing it in that positive context about health and well-being and quality of life, I think that's the way. Rather than saying if you don't do this, you're going to fall down and end up in hospital and, you know, all these terrible things, I, I think we need to frame it in that, you know, preventative health well-being conversation i think that's going to get more buy-in perfect yeah sounds sounds perfect um craig i think we're about to hit the hour is there anything yeah. else i've missed no, on the group that's come through pretty much most of the comments um i don't think we've missed anything i get i do get a few that drop off my screen but i i yeah, mine does that too. I wondered if it was just mine, but it doesn't sound like yeah. it is. I'm, I'm sure um, Toby said something smart about barefoot running. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going there. I can't find that post. I can't find it. None of us want to go there. No one wants to go there. <laughs> yeah, been there, done that. Um, that was a that was two, 2010 we had that chat. Um, yeah. I can't see anything else. Someone's just said hi. Hi, mum. Lily, is it? Oh, that's my daughter. <laughs> is that actually your daughter? Amazing. I thought that might have been some, someone having a laugh, but that is actually your daughter. Okay, fair enough. Is she in the other room? Watch uh, yes, like, uh, they're on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I've told well, her not to come out of her bedroom, so she's, um, yeah. But don't they don't they know it's school holidays? You, you can sleep in on, on a school non-school day. Um, yes, well... <laughs> Okay, it's probably probably a good note to finish on. So thanks so much, Annette. Um, it's, it's actually been good. It's been good for me to revise and um, catch up on what's been happening. It. So um, thanks again, Annette. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for having me. And thank, thank you for yeah. everyone who's tuned in. It's, it's been lovely. Thanks so much, Annette.